Oh my God. Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome back to Listography. Jason, Joe, and Krams are here. And today we are ranking the albums of Neil Young. So there's a lot of records to get to. Uh, real quickly, what we are counting and not counting. All of his solo up studio albums, not anything with Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Not Long May You Run with Stephen Stills. But basically just his solo albums and stuff with Crazy Horse we're counting. But we're not counting any of his soundtracks. No Journey Through the Past or uh, Dead Man. There's a bunch of other ones that are kind of in gray areas. We are counting Rust Never Sleeps and Time Fades Away, which are live recordings, but sort of new songs that kind of fit into his uh, studio output in a way. So by our, our count, there's 43 records for us to rank, quite a lot. Normally when we do a larger discography, we do five at a time. So that's what we're going to do again today. Since there's 43, I guess we'll start with the bottom three. You guys got anything to add before we jump in? Yes. I love Neil Young. He's a top five artist for me, probably the number five spot, but I hated doing this but I still love Neil Young. And there's a lot of albums that are just kind of, you don't want to go revisit. There's only a couple that I think are truly lousy. And like I said, I enjoy all the musical elements of Neil Young. So, you know, I, don't, I didn't dislike this, but I disliked this task of having to go through so many albums that, you know, I mean, the cream of the crop for Neil is just some of the best music you'll come across. But then there's a lot of just stuff. He, he has no filter or editing. Like, he has no mind for editing. It's just like someone, I was reading an article and they said, you know, if, if Neil has a feeling about one thing, he immediately wants to write 10 songs about it. And then it seems like he does. And it just gets recorded and then boom, you've got a new album. So, you know, maybe, you know, it, it's an argument of is, is it ever too much of a good thing? Do a lot of lousy albums discredit all the great stuff? Is it an aggregate score? Something maybe we'll talk about in side three, um, but I still love them. I just kind of hated doing this. I think it would have been a lot better if like we had listened to these albums as they came out through the years instead of doing it all at once, because it is so much of like a an overload, especially when you get to the, the later years. One Neil Young album a year, that's that's fine. You know, some of the Lenoise and A Letter Home and Fork in the Road, stuff like that. If I had to listen to that like once, within the context of a hundred other albums, great. But listening to all of them back to back to back kind of is just like, it's a, it's a task. It really is. The, the viewers better appreciate what we're doing here because it was not, it was not easy. No, it was, uh, it was the slog of slogs for me. Um, uh, but it was better. I sort of started going back through in the opposite direction, going from newer to, to the older stuff the second time through and, and, that was much more enjoyable. Uh, but I guess we'll just jump in. There's a lot to get to. So start with bottom three. Uh, you want me to start off? Yes. All right. The worst Neil Young album is This Notes For You. There's a lot of other Neil Young records around this time period that are pretty bad, but I think all of those have moments or, or at least things about them that are interesting or I could see somebody being into it. But this is just so generic. I can't imagine anyone listening to this and, and being like, yeah, this is great. Um, so that's why it's the bottom for me. 42, I have Life, uh, Bad 80s Production, some of the worst sounding drums I've ever heard on the track, Too Lonely. Just doesn't work very much for me. 41, I have Landing on Water. This record has a lot of interesting moments and a, a, like kind of some cool ideas, but it doesn't really add up to a good record for me. So those are the worst three in my book. I agree on the dead last. Uh, this note's for you by a landslide. Um, what are horns? What's a horn section doing in a Neil Young album? I don't know. It's way too lively. It's way too peppy. The horns and nothing you want out of Neil Young is on this album. I do appreciate that it's sort of this um, criticism of the commercialization of a lot of like classic rock artists. But as far as the aesthetic to and what it does to my ears, no thank you. 42 is going to be, are you passionate? i um, not really sure. It doesn't kind of also feel like a Neil Young album. It's really kind of slippery and has a lot of kind of like R&B 
Let's Roll sounds like it's just trying to be an Aerosmith song. And then number 41, I've got maybe a controversial pick here, Living With War. A lot of people like it. It's one of the newer ones. I hate the mix. All I hear are the high two strings of the guitar and just a ton of cymbals. And man, it is really contrived with its uh, political commentary. It just beats you over the head. I don't know if Paul Haggis, who directed Crash, also had a touch on this album because there's no subtlety or tact on this whatsoever. Well, we are going to have some wildly different lists, it looks like, which is cool. I like this. Um, my number 43 is Greendale. I hate it. I hate everything about it. It's just contrived. I hate the faux megaphone two songs at the end where he's singing through the girl or whatever. It's just awful garbage. Just hated everything about it. Number 42, I got Living With War. Ramser said it's just too much, just beating you over the head. And number 41, uh, Fork in the Road, which is, again, it's beating you over the head, but this time about his car and the environment, and it's just, it's lousy stuff. All right, 40 through 36. These are all kind of, late period records that are all fine but super forgettable number 40 i have colorado just more of the same a lot of songs about the environment but the songs aren't that interesting to make people care about what he's singing about so it kind of defeats the purpose 39 like joe said fork in the road fuel line is kind of a cool song some of the guitars on this record are cool but just mostly him yelling about clean energy and it's not not that interesting number 38 i have the visitor this is a record he did with Promise of the Real. There's some okay stuff at the beginning of this record, uh, but Carnival in the middle just totally kills it. Eight, eight and a half minutes of totally unbearable, I don't even know what it is. It's one of the worst songs in his catalog. Um, and that song alone probably drops this record five spots on my list. Le Noise at 37. Cool guitar tones, but it's exhausting to listen to for an entire album. And 36, I have The Monsanto Years, which is another record with Promise of the Real. Uh, a little bit more enjoyable than the others, but still nothing from this one really sticks with me. And we are going to have drastically different lists and opinions. Carnival is like the only song on The Visitor I really like. Um, number 40, I've got Peace Trail. Um, John Oaks and Texas Strangers are two of my least favorite Neil Young songs I've ever heard. 39, I've got Everybody's Rockin'. This would have been cool just to have this style of songs on just sporadically on a few albums, but a whole album of like 50s driving doo-wop flavor is not for me. 38, I've got Landing on Water, another kind of weird um, 80s album. 37, I've got the Monsanto years as well. You know, it's kind of just like a better, slightly better version of Living With War. It's still just too political and too bitter. And then... 36 i've got old ways um, which has a really good classic neil sound but it's just too clean for me and a bit boring and like jason said a lot of the later ones all kind of have that same feel just kind of about how memorable the songs are and colorado is actually the one that sticks out a little bit for me so that'll come later all right um this one's a little closer to jason's i got it 40 the letter home which that was the one we recorded through like a phone, whatever, just the, the whole, his concepts are so weird and he just, he sticks to them and that's all he does. Like none of these later albums have any variety that drives me crazy. Speaking of number 39, Lenoise, again, it's a concept that could have worked on like two songs and then please do something different. Um, just, it overwhelms you. Uh, 38, I have The Visitor, which I guess it's about Donald Trump. I don't even remember. It's just more politicizing and not that great. Uh, number 37, I have Broken Arrow, which was like later 90s and just completely anonymous. Uh, this was with Crazy Horse. Just didn't like it. And number 36, I got Chrome Dreams, which is okay, but again, it's just there's not much there that you haven't already heard uh he's just kind of rehashing things at this point all right wow i disagree with that last one uh, i got chrome dreams much higher on my list number 35 for me is going to be everybody's rocking this was kind of his i guess middle finger at the record company when they asked him to make a rock record when he tried to turn in old ways i guess in that respect it's kind of funny but it's not good to listen to um number 30 
four, I have Living With War. This is the anti-Bush album. It's a rare late period record where the ferocity of the music sort of matches his message that he's um, trying to put across. There's a bit of urgency to it, but still the songs aren't very good. Uh, 33, I have A Letter Home. This is the one he recorded at Third Man, cut directly uh, to wax as he was recording it. It's kind of cool, lo-fi vibe, um, but nothing on it's really essential. Uh, number 32, I have Psychedelic Pill, which is his longest album. Uh, there's some cool songs on here, but this record doesn't need to be this long. There's two tracks that are over 16 minutes. I don't know, this could have been a late career highlight because there is some good stuff on it, but the length of it kind of kind of wears on me. And number 31, I have Americana which is kind of like rockin' updates of standard American folk songs. It's a pretty cool concept, and I, and I actually do like it. I think the concept both makes it interesting and you know puts a ceiling on how good it can be and how high I can rank it, but it's cool. Number 35 for me is going to be Greendale. Not a very memorable rock opera, um, but I really like the sound on it. 34, I've got Fork in the Road. Um, a bit simple. Some of the guitar work is good, but again, we're in kind of this batch of albums that just aren't as memorable and the songs aren't as good. Number 33 is where I've got Americana, um, like Jason said. Unless, unless some kind of cool covers. Always kind of was weird that he spelled out the word banjo in the song um, but, and uh oh Susanna 32 I've got life kind of like the 80s experimental sound on it but it's not memorable I do kind of like the way the vocals start to sound here from like the mid to late 80s through the mid 90s really hollow reverby sound and I kind of like Inca Queen even though there's some really weird sound effects on it I kind of like it and then 31, I've got Storytone, um, Action School, really um, a lot of stuff going on symphonically. Um, and then on the deluxe edition, there's some really cool solo stuff. Um, so the songs kind of are lifted on the deluxe edition because they stand on their own a little bit. Um, but again, just a lot of environmental kind of songs. Um, but the production is the highlight there. And after th uh, that is kind of where I think that we get out of the lousy range to decent. So. Okay, moving on. I got 35, the Monsanto years, which I thought was pretty decent musically. Um, tough to take an album called Monsanto years seriously, but I thought musically it worked pretty well, and I pretty much just ignored the lyrics. Um, 34, I got Peace Trail, which I don't remember much of, but I remember being okay with it, so it's, it's a 34. Uh, uh, 33, I have Story Tone, which I, you know, I kind of enjoyed the, the orchestration. I just wish it wasn't the entire album. Number 32, I have Are You Passionate, which I really wanted to like more. And there's two, I think the song Are You Passionate and She's a Healer are really, really good songs and they kind of elevate the album. The, his vocals on You're My Girl, he's trying to pull off like the R&B and it's, it's pretty bad. But I think the album picks up. It's with uh, Booker T and the MGs, which I think is cool. I think it's one of his cooler sort of like, you know, themed albums that he went with. Tried to mix it up. I think it's a cool album. Number 31, I got Silver and Gold, which is kind of just like a not as good Harvest Moon and Prairie Wind. So it's, it's, it's fine, but it doesn't, it's just not great. Into the top 30 now. Number 30, I have Greendale. Uh, his rock opera. It's okay. I actually love the track Bandit from it. I wouldn't call the record great, but it's a worthwhile listen, I think. Number 29, I have Hitchhiker. Uh, this is like one of his lost albums that came out, part of his archive series. Good songs, but many of them appear elsewhere in his catalog and put together as a full LP. It's It's kind of boring, kind of long. It's all sort of one sort of style and sound the whole way through. Number 28, I have Peace Trail. This is a record that he made with uh, Jim Keltner and uh, Paul Bushnell. Uh, they recorded it together in four days. I like the sound of it a lot. I think it's a really cool sounding record, um, but I like the sound of it more than the songs, uh, but it's not bad. At number 27, I have Storytone. This is another great sounding record, really well recorded orchestral arrangements and big band arrangements. Uh, the songs could be better, but it is an uh, enjoyable listen. Number 26, I have Broken Arrow. 
It's a big, loud rock record uh, with some long jams uh, that I think are actually pretty decent among some of his longer songs. I think the first three tracks on this record are are among the better ones of those. Um, and that is it. Number 30 for me is going to be A Letter Home, the phonograph album. You guys already hit the nail on the head. It's interesting, but a little much to take for an entirety. Um, 29, I've got The Visitor. It is kind of, I do kind of like some of the musical elements on it. And I like, like I said, um, Carnival and Change of Heart. 20. Eight, I've got silver and gold. Songs are a bit um, forgettable, but it does have a kind of more classic Neil style. Um, like Joe said, a bit of a Harvest sequel, Harvest Moon sequel. 27, I've got Chrome Dreams. Kind of the same thing. Um, I really like Boxcar and just not a plethora of really good songs. A few. 26, I've got Broken Arrow um, coming out of um, a really good period of 90s albums. Still has that loose guitar, crazy horse feel to it, um, but maybe running out of gas a little bit and running out of their best material. Okay. <clears throat> Number 30, I have Americana, the covers album, which I think probably his best songs, even though he didn't write any of them. So that kind of tells you about how I think about late period Neil. I enjoyed the songs more than pretty much everything after, uh, but it gets points docked for being a cover album. 29, I got Everybody's Rocking. I kind of like the, the 50s detour. I find it a lot more interesting to listen to than you know most of his, his later work. Uh, 28, I have Colorado, which I think is a pretty good late period kind of rebirth. I think Crazy Horse sounds better than they have on this album in decades 27 i got the the jazzy this notes for you which you guys hate but again i'll, I'll take something like this where it's interesting and different uh over his just you know late period where he's just the same sound over and over and then number 26 i got psychedelic pill which is another kind of later period one probably my favorite of his 2000s 2010s output um the songs are a little too long. The album's a little too long, but I, you know, it, it has energy. It has some nice guitar, and um, thought it was pretty decent. All right, number twenty-five. I've got Hawks and Doves. Feels a bit cobbled together because it is taking songs that he had recorded over the previous few years, kind of stitching it together. Um, he does some straight country on this record, but I think he does that better on. Uh, old ways. At number 24, I have Trans. I think this is actually a really cool and unique record. The songs are good. The actual issue with this record is actually the few songs that don't really fit into that really heavy 80s pop sound and, and kind of detract from what he's really trying to do. I think if he leaned into it even further, it would be um, that much better. At number 23, I have Freedom, or a solid bounce back record after a string of, of some of his worst records. Um, I think this is pretty good. Um, some nice, quieter, folky moments mixed with some loud, uh, heavy guitar distortion. Number 22, I have Homegrown. This is the most recent one to be released. This is another one of those sort of lost records from the 70s that he put out. It sounds and feels like classic Neil, but there's something missing from it that keeps it out of the upper tier. And at number 21, I've got Are You Passionate, the record with Booker T and the MGs. Not all of this works. I, I think the music sounds really good. The band plays really well. Sometimes his vocals don't really fit in, but I do think it's uh, kind of a cool and interesting record. Well, none of it really works, um, which is why I appropriately had it in the 40s. Um, and freedom that low, crazy, crazy. But our brains are all a little boiled to death right now, so we could be saying things we don't really mean. 25, I've got Prairie Wind, really laid back, meditative and kind of persistent. Some good songs on it. 24, I've got the debut self-titled. He's not quite himself yet, kind of still carried over from Buffalo Springfield, but you can tell um, by now, like, he's got a knack for good songwriting. Um, so right around this time, I'm, I'm thinking these are all... Not great Neil Young albums, but 
recommended Neil Young albums from here on out. I'll probably starting from Perry Wind on up. 23, I've got Colorado. I like this a lot more than you guys do, maybe just because it's fresh in my mind from last year. But I think it's, um, like Joe said, um, the best Crazy Horses sound. There's a lot of craft um, and kind of nuance to the songs that have kind of been missing. It's not kind of just slapped on and recorded. 22, I've got Hawks and Doves, Half Leftovers, Half New Stuff. Not amazing, but none of it's really bad. 21, Hitchhiker, which I kind of like. Back to basics. I'm not reinventing anything, but pretty good. Okay. Uh, for me, starting with 25, I have Sleeps with Angels. Um, you know, I don't really like Neil Young's 90s output much at all, I found. I mean, I do. I don't hate it. It's better than the recent stuff, but something missing for me. Just not, didn't. I don't know, just couldn't get into it or something. Uh, 24, I have Mirrorball, the one he did with Pearl Jam, which, again, I thought, okay, Pearl Jam, Neil Young, that's a slam dunk, but just didn't like it. Nothing stuck. It didn't sound like a, a good fit. I, okay, I didn't dislike it, but we're, we're in 24. But, again, some of these are just, you know, I probably wouldn't listen to them again unless I had to. 23, I got Prairie Wind, which is fine. I like some of the instrumentation. I think he probably sounds better with kind of a softer country folky feel than he does, you know, with the hard rock stuff at this point in his career. I mean, this was late 2000s, I think. Number 22, we have Landing on Water, which I thought got a bad rap. Um, I think from here on up, actually, are all, these are like my recommended meals, we'll say. So this is like halfway through the list. I think Landing on Water is cool. I like the 80s sound. I like that he's kind of embracing it. I don't think the songs are bad, so I don't, I don't really get where everyone kind of hates this one. And then same with 21, uh, which I have Life, which, you know, it's kind of like Neil trying to do Journey or something, like it's kind of arena rock. But I think it's an interesting detour. Definitely prefer this kind of to the, the newer stuff or the 90s stuff. So I don't know. I, I dig 80s Neil. I wish he even leaned into it even more. All right, top 20 now. Uh, number 20, I've got Sleeps with Angels, a dark, brooding, and dense record. I really like the tracks Western Hero and Train of Love. This is kind of him embracing his uh, godfather of grunge title. Uh, number 19, I have Time Fades Away, a record that was recorded live during his uh, classic period. But uh, some new songs here. Um, I think the songs are good, but for me, the live recordings of them are a little too off the cuff and a little too rough around the edges. I think that if this was recorded as a proper studio album in a studio, these tracks are, m might be able to climb into my top 10. Um, I, I like the ballads on this record more than the, than the rockers. Number 18, I've got Prairie Wind. Uh, this is a slight return to his classic sort of Harvest era sound. The songwriting's not as good, but there are some great songs on it like The Painter and Here For You. Number 17, I have Silver and Gold. I like the sound of this record more than Prairie Wind. I think it has a nice fuller sound, but it's in a similar vein, kind of sort of that looking back towards sort of his classic era. I think the songs are really good. The title track on this record is fantastic. And at number 16, I have Old Ways, country record that he made in the 80s. I think it's really good. I think anyone that watches the channel regularly knows that I like that sort of classic country sound. You got Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson guest appearing on this record. You also got uh, Bela Fleck, Spooner Oldham, Joe Osborne, just kind of a who's who of session players and songs are good. I think it sounds great. All right. My number 20 is going to be Homegrown. Um, it is what it is. Um, you know, I think it because it's the songs that didn't make old albums, uh, the whole thing plays a little bit slow and is a little bit oversaturated with sadness, kind of, but there's some really good songs on it. I think the songs stand on their own really well, but the whole album keeps it from getting higher than that, but it is a good album. 19 is going to be Lenoise. I disagree with you guys. I think this um, is a really cool product and really creative. Um, love all of the distortion and bizarre guitar sounds. and It works. 18, I agree with Jason on Time Fades Away. I think the songs are really good, but unlike Russ Never Sleeps, it doesn't have the magic of the live recording that that one does. Um, probably would have been better in the studio. Really like Love and Mind and The Bridge. Really, um, really miss... Or miss. I really like a lot of the piano stuff he's done throughout his career, and I don't think he does enough of it that might play into my top 10 songs. 
Number 17, I've got American Stars and Bars. You know, you've got Linda Ronstadt and Amy Lou Harris. Um, it makes it for just a really cool sound and Like a Hurricane Rules, um, just a really good album. And then 16 is where I've got Trans, um, just so different, um, so out of his comfort zone, enjoyable. It sounds like he got together with Brian Eno and you know, David Bowie and just was like, I want to be with you guys and want to smoke a J and do what you guys do. So it kind of has, you know, that, that techno, techno computer early 80 sound, but Jason's right. Then there's some stuff that doesn't. And it's just like, what happened here? So, but I do like it quite a bit. Okay. We're getting into the, the meat of things here. I, I like all these albums. Uh, so 20, I got Hitchhiker, which I mean, it's classic Neil compositions. I think the album, I think it would be higher if it was like a real album instead of sort of cast offs and songs that were already on other things. So, but it, it's cool and it, I don't know, it's, it's just a, it's a good Neil Young album. 19, I got Reactor, which is fine. It kind of comes in a period for me of albums that all kind of, between Mad Hawks and Doves and Russ Never Sleeps are all kind of, the same sounding a little bit. I think this is the weakest one with Crazy Horse. 18, I got Harvest Moon, which was a nice kind of rebirth in the 90s, sort of continuation of Harvest, but a little more romantic. Title track's really good. Um, I like the instrumentation. I like, usually when, when artists reach their third, fourth decade, I feel like they should probably switch to like this country folk Americana -y sound because uh, I think it matches them better. And I think this is sort of a, a testament to that. 17, I got Freedom, which was his like 90s or 89, kind of back out of the weirdness of the 80s stuff that he was doing, uh, back to rocking, back to sort of half acoustic, half hard rock, kind of how he did it on um, Rest Never Sleeps. And then 16, I got Time Fades Away, like you guys said, it would be, probably be better in the studio. You know, it was recorded early 70s, so the technology probably just wasn't there to get a, a really nice kind of clean sound like he does on a couple later live albums. But I really like kind of the boogie of Time Fades Away, the, the track. It's pretty good, but it needed, uh, I don't know, some more overdubs or something to be a great album, I think. 15 to 11, this is probably the most controversial batch of albums on my list. Uh, number 15, I have my favorite record of his of the 21st century, which is Chrome Dreams 2. I love Beautiful Bluebird. Ordinary People is a really long track that I think is actually really, really cool. Spirit Road is great. Yeah, this stands up to his classic stuff for me. I think it's awesome. Uh, number 14, I have Ragged Glory, one of his 90s records. Uh, this is a another sort of really good combination of his heavy fuzzed out guitar tone with good songwriting, uh, which throughout his career, he doesn't always get both of them together at the same time. I love Over and Over, Country Home, Mansion on the Hill, a lot of good songs on that one. 13, I have his record with Pearl Jam, Mirrorball. The songwriting on this record, probably not as good as on Ragged Glory, but I love the sort of feel of this record. You could, it really sounds like they're all just in a room together jamming. I love the guitar interplay between Neil and Mike McCready, and there's just a lot more energy on this record. Pearl Jam really, you know, picks up the tempo a little bit and, and I think pushes Neil in, in a good way. And then 12 and 11, the probably most controversial placements on my list. The fact that these two records aren't in my top 10 might upset some people, but number 12 for me is On the Beach. It's at, as high as number 12 because I like the sound of it and the feel of it. But for me, the songs have just never connected with me. I don't really like many of the songs. Uh, See the Sky About to Rain is maybe the only one that I really like. Number 11, I have Rust Never Sleeps. A lot of good songs, but I think there's two things that work against this record. I think the fact that it's split into an acoustic side and a more electric side almost never works. I wish artists would stop doing this. Everyone tries it probably once and it's it's never good. And then this sort of like pseudo live feel, it's recorded live, but you can't hear the crowd. There's times where like, you'll hear them start to clap for like two seconds and then it'll drop out. I think it's really distracting. So good songs, but for me, not top 10. 
I don't really like Bon Jovi, but I saw him live in 2003, and I was like, it should at least be fun. It'll be loud and energetic. And the first 40 minutes was all acoustic, and they did like a lot of the big hits as acoustic pieces. And I was just like, what the hell is this? It was like living on a prayer with just him and acoustic guitar. I was like, yeah, I don't think so, buddy. All right. Well, 15, I've got psychedelic pill um which i really like um i think it's creative uh some of the songs are a bit too long but i kind of like it and i really like the distortion like guitar vocal combo 14 i've got reactor this is just a really cool heavy simple tough loud garage rock band album i feel like 13 i've got comes a time the songs are good but i kind of feel like it just needs a little bit of a shot in the arm um maybe a little bit of something new for neo at this time 12, I've got Sleeps with Angels. Um, I really like this whole kind of era of Neil. Um, it's really dark, remorseful. I do like the song Drive By quite a bit. And then number 11, I've got Mirrorball. I'm with Jason. I don't think the songs are that great, but as an album, it really is awesome. Um, they play a little bit tighter and faster than Crazy Horse. And like Jason said, it makes some, for some nice guitar interplay. So that's it. I mean, I love Pearl Jam, so I dig it. All right. Uh, for 15, I have his self-titled debut, Neil Young. I think if all the songs were as good as The Loner and I've Been Waiting For You, then it would be like a top five because there's some really kind of cool like country, you know, not the, the Neil Young you expect, but the songs probably aren't, aren't quite as good as his later stuff. He's still kind of finding his, his way. It's a little more, it's definitely more produced than his kind of later albums. It's very kind of rich and, you know, it has that country feel to it. So it's a, it's a really cool album. I'd never heard it before. It's definitely worth a listen. 14, I got Neil Young's, 80s classic trans, uh, which I really liked. I love the songs, you know, the vocoder and the weird <laughs> vocal effects and stuff that, I don't know if it makes it better or worse. I kind of want to hear the songs without that, but I do think it's cool. I like, I even like the songs that are just straight kind of Neil Young songs. Just a, a really cool album. It was not received kindly, but people are dumb. Uh, 13, I got Ragged Glory, which I thought was really strong. You know, this is 1990. The work of, of Crazy Horse on this sounds like what grunge is. You know, it almost predated some of the big grunge records. But I thought this was a, a much better representation of kind of the sound and the sound of grunge than, than Mirrorball was. A lot of good songs, ton of energy, almost, almost in the top 10. Number 12, I got Hawks and Doves, which it does have a couple songs from Homegrown. So it kind of, it's not a true maybe album. It's sort of songs that just kind of came together. So it is a little disjointed, but I think the songs are all pretty good. Little Wing, I like better on this than on Homegrown. I think Old Homestead's pretty good, Captain Kennedy. So just a, a good album. His first 80s album, I guess, but it doesn't sound like the 80s. And then 11, I got Homegrown, the Lost album came out this year. It's dark and kind of depressing and forlorn. And I guess I can see why he shelved it for so long. It was so personal. But, um, you know, Star Bethlehem's great. Little Wing, uh, Separate Ways, the opener is fantastic. And it's just, it's depressing. It's a definitely a depressing listen. Florida and um, the other state one, I forget exactly what it is. Uh, weird, it's like him doing the music on the rims of wine glasses. So it, it's weird. It's just a weird album, but it, it's cool. It's um it's classic period Neil, even if it's not the songwriting is not maybe quite as good as his top 10 stuff. All right, into the top 10 now. We're going to go one at a time from this point on. My number 10 is Comes a Time. Um, maybe his nicest record. Very pleasant. Um, not really any of my favorite Neil Young songs on it, but the cumulative effect of all of them together is just a really enjoyable mellow listening experience yeah i like it a lot comes a time number 10. my number 10 is gonna be ragged glory yeah i mean this is like the godfather of grunge album it's awesome that he was a able to hang with the the boys the younger crowd here as the grunge era takes off and 
he just slays here. I mean, I think a lot of these albums stand up to some of the other stuff of the time. First three tracks are just phenomenal. You can tell like his confidence is back and he's having fun again after, you know, freedom was kind of a success. Love to Burn is epic. Guitar solo in it. It's great. It's kind of got like the perfect guitar garage grunge sound to it. Nothing too fancy, just kind of letting the, the rawness take over. Um, and he's kind of got that blue collar feel back that he recaptured on Freedom that he kind of lost from the in a lot of the 80s with the sound and Country Home, White Line, really awesome. And, you know, it's good that he's kind of got his swagger back. So really dig it. For my number 10, I have the Neil Young classic Old Ways, which I had to buy on CD because... It, of course, is not available on Spotify or pretty much anywhere. You can kind of piece it together on YouTube. I should have, you know, if I'd known how much I liked this album, I would have bought it on vinyl, but I was like, oh, Neil Young Country, is that going to work? Is, is there a reason this is basically out of print? Uh, but I loved it. I love the country sound. I think it fits Neil Young perfectly. You know, he kind of dabbled in country before, but this is like, let's just go all out. There's a thousand different guests on this. Uh, like Jason said earlier, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Bella Fleck. We brought in a pedal steel guitar player and a fiddle player and, you know, multiple fiddle players, mandolin, harmonica, banjos. You know, the songwriting probably isn't as, as Neil Youngy as you'd like. It's kind of just playing to that country sound. But I think the whole album sounds great. It's produced great. The guest stars are great. Willie Nelson's great on it. Waylon Jennings is great on it. And it's just, uh, I think it's a must listen in, in Neil Young's discography. And I think I wish he would, you know, bring it back and be proud of the fact that he made a great country record. There's nothing nothing to be ashamed of, Neil. Yeah, uh, I really like Old Ways, too. And in my original draft of my list, I had it at number seven. And, and it got dropped down quite a bit, but it, it, maybe I should still have it higher. I don't know. It's, it is really good. I think it's great. My number nine is Reactor. A lot of heavy guitar on this record. I think that's probably the main draw, but unlike some of his other really heavy guitar uh, sort of distorted records. This one has got a real sense of fun to it. And at times it even kind of borders on being goofy. And I think that makes it a, a really unique record in his catalog. I really like it. Opera Star is really cool. Motor City, Southern Pacific. I think there's just a lot of really good, fun songs with a lot of great uh, guitar work on it. I think it's a really cool record. And I think it's uh, really overlooked. I think it's Awesome. My number nine is going to be Two Nights to the Night. It's really kind of rootsy, but it has a bit of a modern sound for him. really like the sound of the low end. It's got a little bit of a higher pitch than what we were used to chronologically going up. Title track's great. It's kind of just like this despaired, bluesy album. Um, vocals are nice and raw. Great guitar work throughout. Borrowed tune is really gorgeous. I like Come On Baby, Let's Go Downtown a good bit. Um, favorite song in the album is without a doubt, mellow my mind. Um, and he did this with the Santa Monica Flyers, which is interesting. And I think it's just kind of sticks out a little bit um, in this era of Neil and I like it a good bit. So number nine, tonight's the night. My number nine is going to be Rest Never Sleeps. I kind of see where Jason's coming from with the whole like acoustic and then electric. It's kind of weird. I do kind of like the way he spins My My Hey Hey out of the blue into Hey Hey My Mind of the Black. At the end, I think that's a cool kind of way to do things. He does that again on, on Freedom with Rockin' in the Free World, but I think My My Hey Hey and Hey Hey My My are better songs. Uh, Thrasher is really cool, kind of country tune, old kind of Harvest era kind of tune. Uh, Pocahontas is great. Powderfinger, really cool. Uh, sedan delivery sounds like Rusty Cage, so it's like, you, you hear that and it's like, okay, so this is where grunge came from, Sedan Delivery, the first grunge song. And I don't mind the, the live kind of recording, I think it adds a little, a little rawness to it. Just a really, really strong album from, from Neil. My number eight is going to be Harvest Moon. Uh, this is kind of his midlife crisis record in a way. I don't know, it's kind of like reflective, looking back at the past and you know, talking to his generation and saying, look how far we've come. But it, it really is a really strong set of songs. I think it's his best uh, set of songs since the record. 
that I have at number seven, one spot ahead of it, which I'll reveal, reveal shortly. And I don't think he ever wrote another set of songs this good again after this record. Just really, really strong songwriting. And that's, I mean, all you need to have a great record. My number eight is gonna be Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere. Um, and like Jason said, um, in regards to his review of Harvest Moon, it's just a great set of amazing pieces of songwriting. Everyone knows kind of the hits, Cinnamon Girl and Down by the River, um, but Round and Round is also great. Losing End is great. Cowgirl in the Sand is just an amazing way to close it out. And I mean, just to me, night and day from the debut to this one, um, really found his voice. The songwriting is fantastic. And, you know, it's just a great, even though it's the second album, it's a great introduction for what Neil Young's going to bring to the table um, and has just a really cool like 60s jammy guitar feel all over it, just smothered in it, um, which I really dig. So a really, 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 really great album. Everybody knows this is nowhere. Which is also my number eight. I only have some sort of agreement here. Yay. Uh, you know, Cinnamon Girl's awesome. Sort of, you know, still has that classic 60s sound, but I think he's like, pushing into the 70s with this. There's some you know, jammy stuff, some jangly guitar. The backup vocals uh, definitely kind of help fill out Neil's voice. Uh, but, it, you know, it's just a really cool album. It's kind of raw and energetic and sort of primitive, but just a great set of tunes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a classic. So just a classic album. I am pretty surprised that you both have that record that low. And I think the internet's going to be mad at you. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, you think the internet's mad at us, buddy. Wait till they see your number 12 and 11. So. No, no, I think that's more egregious than, than mine. But we will see. Uh, my number seven is American Stars and Bars. This is uh, a record assembled of tracks that he recorded from 74 to 77. It's very country heavy, which always, you know, I always enjoy. Um, so I think highly of it because of that. There's a few good rockers thrown in as well, though. Um, rock, uh, like a Hurricane. I almost said Rocky like a Hurricane. <laughs> um, is great. But I think the even better rocker on this record is Bite the Bullet, uh, which has some really blistering guitar and some great female backing vocals on it. But like I said, the whole, the whole record's really good. Um, the country tunes are really well written and they sound great. Some good pedal steel playing on it. And I just like it a lot. My number seven is going to be Rust Never Sleeps. The division of the acoustic and electric set doesn't bother me here because I get the purpose of it. And I think it shows off the songs appropriately. And Joe's right, bookending with the different versions of the my my hey 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 my my is really great and there's just not a bad song on the album um pocahontas sail away thrasher good call on S sedan delivery um powder finger it's just fantastic and unlike time fades away it is cool that he's introducing these songs in a live format for the first time i grew up knowing that um my my hey hey was like a greatest hits neil young song and always heard the live version on the radio and I was like why is there not more like crowd reaction to this song and then it made sense later when I found out you know what the album was about but I was always like why is no one like and as soon as he starts playing they should be going ape shit for it but makes sense so it's a great album number seven Russ never sleeps okay for my number seven I have on the beach definitely different than what he had put out previously with like Harvest and after the gold rush, it's a little bluesier. It's a little, I don't know, it has like a, a different, just complete feel to it. For Neil Young albums, especially in the seventies, like after the gold rush has this, this feeling of kind of like loneliness. Harvest is kind of like big and, you know, extravagant a little bit. And this one's sort of like, I don't know, like apocalyptic almost, like he's just like in mourning. And it's just, you know, song like Walk On just kind of starts out kind of happy and then it has this kind of like darkness to it. Um, to the Sky About to Rain, I think is fantastic. One of his best sort of ballads. Um, you know, there's some something like Vampire Blues where he's kind of talking about the oil industry and kind of, you know, stealing from Mother Earth. You know, I don't mind his 70s kind of activism. It's, it's cloying and over the top later, but 
this kind of it all kind of fits natural into this sort of like this mood that he's in for this whole album ending it with ambulance blues um and just kind of a little depressing kind of album he's definitely not in a, a happy place with this one but uh it's just a, a really good album really kind of cool guitar sound and just kind of one of the unique kind of pieces of Neil. There's so many like different things that he brought to the table in the 70s. And this is, you know, just a, a unique kind of look into what he was thinking and doing in 73 or four, whenever this came out. All right, my number six is the self-titled debut. I think this is a really strong record. I think the songs are great. I think, I think Cram said that he, wasn't really himself yet, but I disagree. I think he comes out of the box fully formed. Great songs. The Loner, I think, is one of the best songs in his catalog. Just missed my top 10. And the whole thing just sounds really good. Uh, this this sound is is what I like the most with Neil. So, uh, yeah, I think it's great. My number six is an album that I'm surprised you guys had so far in, towards the 20s. I've got Freedom. Um, I really like it. It's... Um, it's him kind of proving himself after kind of the string of failures of the 80s. I think he f kind of forgot what his artistic voice was, and now he kind of figured out that he still had something to say about the 80s and, you know, the material that was giving him. So it comes out as really blue collar and political for the first time in a while. Um, you know, it's got a lot more like ghostly, hollow, distant sound to his voice, which I love. I even like the cover of On Broadway. Um, the bass is really good on this album. The piano on Wrecking Ball is great. Too Far Gone has some cool arrangements. Rockin' in the Free World is a classic. Um, no More is great, El Dorado. Just really like the sound. It's not quite the grunginess of Ragged Glory and then the albums after that, but it's getting really close, step in the right direction. And I think there's just a lot of uh, just a lot of finding himself again on this album. And you can kind of hear like the excitement and kind of the passion again for the first time in a while. Certainly wasn't on the album before this. Um, so I really, really liked Freedom quite a lot. And I think it sounds great, too. For my number six, <clears throat> originally I had this like way lower. And fortunately, I listened to it again a couple of times. Of course, I'm talking about Tonight's the Night. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I just wasn't listening hard enough the first time because the second time through I was like what what was I doing here this is a great album it's kind of like his death and drugs you know kind of reminds me of like the Rolling Stones actually more than any of his other albums definitely like a bluesy feel kind of almost uh exile on main street but it's him uh there's songs from Crazy Horse there's songs from the Santa Monica Flyers there's songs from the Stray Gators this is his backing band on this uh, Look Out Joe's awesome, uh, Speaking Out, Rolling on a String's great, Mellow My Mind. He was super depressed, I think, when this came out. This is right after the death of uh, Danny Witten, and it's just him so, uh, sort of despondent and thinking about death, and, you know, so it's a really dark album, um, so maybe that's why I didn't love it at first, kind of coming after like Harvest and some of his, his bigger albums. But it's a it's a really kind of cool, unique feel again, you know, after On the Beach and Harvest and after the Gold Rush, this has a distinct kind of feel to it um, of darkness and sort of, you know, he's probably really stoned and drugged out on this. So it comes through in the music and it's, it's very cool. Uh, just really great album. Tonight's The Night is my number five. You said a lot of what I was going to say about it comes after the death of Danny Witten and Bruce Berry, who is on his road crew, I believe. It's a really kind of off the cuff sounding record, uh, a lot of raw emotion on it. I think it's kind of backloaded though. I, the last half of this record with Albuquerque, New Mama, and Look, Look Out Joe is just killer. And my favorite song on the record, neither of you mentioned, it's actually my number two song on my top 10, so I'll leave everybody in suspense as to what that is. But uh, yeah, I love this record. All right. My number five is going to be Zuma, which is probably just the quintessential straight up crazy horse backing album to me. Um, they sound great. The whole album has like this intensity with purpose without kind of going off the rails. It's really focused and just like a, just a great rock band album. Um, it's got Cortez the Killer on it. Pardon my heart. Has one of my favorite Neil um, 
sort of like love songs ever with looking for love great lyrics on that when he says i hope that i treat her kind when she starts to see the darker side of me or whatever it is um just kind of like really he was so like had such a reflective like nostalgic sentimental like feeling about his love and his youth even before he was an older guy like it seemed like in his late 20s he was already missing being 16 or 17 or 18 and I really like that sort of reflective nature and you know some of it is just really good rock stuff some of it is a little prettier and don't cry no tears is great this is just fantastic from start to finish. I played around with putting this um, a little higher and um, it kind of got a little bit forgotten when we were doing um, Album of the Year in 75, but that was such a loaded year that I'll forgive myself, but it's definitely a really, really, really great album. Probably, probably close to five out of five stars for me, maybe 4.75, it's fantastic. Zuma. <laughs> for my number five, I have Comes the Time. Really like this sound from Neil. He brought on Nicolette Larson to kind of sing harmony with him, which definitely kind of strengthens, you know, Neil's not the best singer in the world. And I think this, you know, having the, the female kind of counterpart really kind of brings it all up, brings some fullness to it. I think the first half is, you know, phenomenal. Uh, side one's definitely the strongest. Uh, going back comes a time, look out for my love, a lot of love and peace of mind are all almost perfect kind of, you know, folky country, you know, a little, little less hard rock, a little more kind of upbeat, passionate Neil. Second half's not as strong with um, Human Highway and Motorcycle Mamas are still pretty good. Already one's pretty good. Um, but the first half definitely carries the album sort of. I don't know, forgotten about, I guess, in his au revoir. But, uh, you know, I like I like the, the country Neil maybe a little bit more than the hard rock Neil. So this really kind of just gets me. It's my, my kind of album. I, too, prefer the country folky Neil, but uh, one of his best rock records, I think, is Zuma. A lot of really good guitar work. Cortez the Killer is awesome. Don't Cry No Tears is great. It's just a really great guitar record. If you're into guitar playing and especially Neil's guitar playing, I think this is this is like the quintessential Neil Young guitar record. Uh, I think it's awesome. Number four for me is going to be On the Beach. Don't want to say too much about it. I'd rather have everyone take a look at 1974 album of the year um, where I go a little bit more in depth. It was my winner. Um, but it's awesome. Not a bad song on it. Um, Jason, what are you doing? It's such a good, I mean, all of the songs stand out to me. Revolution Blues, Vampire Blues, and Ambulance Blues are probably my three favorites. Um, Ambulance Blues is a tremendous closer. The whole album's got kind of a, a different mood than all of his other albums that I can't always put my finger on. It's kind of like hazy and reflective and he's looking in and looking out and it's it almost seems like a transitional kind of not a transitional record for his sound but kind of for him personally where he like really was just going through a lot mentally and whatever he flushed out is great because all of it is fantastic on the beach number four a five out of five star album gotta be for my number four like jason i have zuma this is like yeah you know jason said his guitar album kind of has like a LA sound to it almost you know I, I kept getting like hints of like eagles uh when listening to this I don't know why exactly but uh, a song like Danger Bird which I like better than Cortez Killer is Cortez the Killer is sort of like a guitar you know focused anthemic sound but Cortez the Killer is great just there's no no weak tracks on this one I think it's maybe one of his most consistently just throughout just awesome you know, if you like the hard rock sound of Neil, this is definitely where you kind of want to go. Um, it's just very kind of Neil at his most rock and putting the pedal down. So, uh, yeah, Zuma, a very good number four for me. All right. My number three is Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere. Just a, a killer record, killer songs, um, some longer, you know, he stretches out a bit a little bit more guitar heavy or a lot more guitar heavy than 
his debut. He doesn't quite have that really fuzzed out sound yet. It's a little bit of, of a thinner guitar tone on this record, but it works really well. And when his songs are good, those extended jams work really well. And there's time in, times in his career where the quality of the songs aren't as good. So the extended jams become a little tedious, but on this record, you know, all the, all the uh, solos are great. Um, the songwriting is so strong. Cowgirl on the Sand, Cinnamon Girl, uh, Round and Round might be my favorite track on the record. I think it's awesome. Like Joe said, uh, when referencing Comes a Time, having the female backing vocals uh, really you know, sort of enhance his vocals. So I don't know what you guys are doing having it at eight, uh, but I think it's almost perfect. It's It's eight. Eight out of 43, dude. <laughs> it's top 10. Really on your high horse for just having it separate by five albums. Jeez. All right. Number three for me is going to be Harvest. Classic album. Not really a bad song out. Um, I was reading that it didn't get great reviews when it first came out, which I didn't know and was kind of surprised by because all the songs are really good. You know, the classics on it are fantastic. Old Man and Heart of Gold and Needle and the Damage Done. I think most of his albums, you can find deep cuts that really make the album great. Um, but I think those are the three that are maybe the best on here. Although I do, well, maybe I do kind of like Are You Ready for the Country a good bit. Um, and then A Man Needs a Maid is cool, which was about his um, wife at the time. A um, really good song. The whole album is really laid back and kind of folky and kind of like really stiff and wooden, but I think really creates that atmosphere of, you know, kind of the old folk Neil, which well represented by me and Jason's flannels. So well, it's a great album. What more can you say? I've got a, the album cover hung up on my wall. It's just, a, again, a classic five out of five star was a contender for album of the year when it came out. It's it's great. It's Harvest, number three. For my number three, I have American Stars and Bars, which kind of like comes a time. It has sort of a, you know, a country folky feel to it. They, you know, the opening song, the old country waltz, waltz country song. That's, you know, like my thing. That's my jam. But it also has, you know, maybe one of his greatest guitar showcases in like a hurricane, just ridiculously... You know, it, it's almost like he's just like playing random notes. Like it, it sounds like a hurricane. It's a fantastic kind of guitar showcase uh, for his, you know, sort of off the cuff, Lucy style. First half of the album, a little more country. Bite the Bullet, though, is an awesome Southern rocker. Just phenomenal. Kind of sounds like a Skinner song, which he was friends with Skinner. I know they had some, some words with uh, Southern Man and then Skinner's response in Sweet Home Alabama, but they were actually friends, and uh, I think they wrote, Neil Young actually wrote a song for them, but I don't know where I'm going with that, but Bite the Bullet's a great song, Star of Bethlehem I think sounds better on this than it does on Homegrown, uh, and Will to Love is a really kind of cool, long, I think it's about a salmon trying to find uh, love spawning or something like that, it's, it's a really weird song, kind of reminds me of like a song like No Quarter, um, just sort of like mumbling and sort of like just this i don't know it's, it's a cool song though uh and it, american stars and bars is a great album and is my number three i love american stars and bars but there's no way it's better than everybody knows this is nowhere no, it's, it's much better i'd much rather listen to it number two for me is harvest i don't really know what else to say about it just a bunch of great songs the production on it's really good I love the way the drums and bass sound on this record, especially it's sort of my favorite type of production. It's just a real bunch of really good songs. I don't, yeah, what else can you say about it? It's, uh, it's great. Although my favorite song is one that uh, Cram didn't mention and will be in my top 10 as well. But until wow. then. Really, really killing it with the promos for the next video here, geez. All right, my number two is going to be one that you guys, the biggest slip up you guys had. It's Harvest Moon. It was almost my number one. Um, this album is just his m most beautiful album. Jason said it was a bit of a midlife crisis album. Yeah, I can kind of see that, um, but it's just gorgeous all the way through. I think this is his best sounding album. Vocal sound, great. There's uh, like an unknown legend. He'll just hit like two lone guitar strings and it'll just seem like it'll go on for eternity. It's absolutely just soundscape 
Beauty. Not a bad song on it. Um, I've got a lot on it that'll be on my top 10 songs list, so you'll have to check out that. Um, but the ones that didn't make my songs list, like From Hank to Hendrix and Such a Woman is almost, almost too corny, but it's just so pretty. And knowing that it's Neil Young for him to have just like, it's probably his most direct, huge ballad where he's just drawing out words where he literally goes, says, I love you over like seven or eight seconds. And the piano's great. Kind of around this time he did a, uh, um, also as well as Springsteen did a song for the movie Philadelphia where he does kind of this sound like he does on such a woman with the piano and the really distant ghostly vocals and that song is great too missed my top 10 but a beautiful song and this period of Neil right in the middle of all this grunge does this just really gorgeous album and Joe was kind of talking earlier about how it's kind of weird that he just picks these ideas for a sound of an album just goes with it all in and it's, it's so weird to me that harvest moon is right here in between these like gunge or grunge albums of the 90s and it's just it's awesome i love it it was very close to being number one which would have probably pissed off the internet but to me number one is just got to be number one which it seems like we might have a triple crown on our hands very soon unless joe has some weird shit going on so we'll see uh no cams are it is the correct choice um I will say, I think putting Harvest Moon at number two is just absolute insanity. Putting it anywhere near his 70s output just blows my mind, but that's fine. I think probably when it came out, if I listened to it then, in sort of the world of grunge, it probably would have been higher on my list, but the fact that I listened to it kind of in a row with something like Harvest or Comes a Time just doesn't hold up for me. And speaking of, my number two is Harvest, almost perfect. Um, I think literally the only criticisms I could have of this is Alabama is pretty close to Southern Man as far as like, it's almost the same thing, which is fine. I like Alabama. When the critics, when this first came out, the critics didn't like it because they thought it was too close to After the Gold Rush, just with some slide guitars and orchestration, which, Again, it's a hard to kind of, you know, that's fine. The critics are dumb. You listen to it now and it's just, it's so good. I don't know how they could have thought these songs are not good. This is the number one album of 72. Sold the most had his, his only number one album, I think. Uh, Heart of Gold, Old Man, Needle and the Damage Done are all perfect. Uh, kind of Neil Young being a pop star almost, but everything else, Harvest, Are You Ready for the Country, I Like Alabama, I Like Out on the Weekend. The only song I think that holds it back is There's a World. I think the orchestration is just way too much. I mean, literally, that's the only you know bad thing about the whole album. Everything else is, is pretty much perfect, and it's you know pretty much as good as you could possibly do to follow up after the Gold Rush, which is everyone's number one, as, as it should be. Yay. Wow. The fifth time that has happened in channel history. Yeah, it's uh, it's the best one. Cram said earlier that he likes his piano stuff a lot, and so do I, and I think this is the album that has the most of it. And um, yeah, every single song on this record is awesome. There's not a bad track. Yeah, his best writing, his best production. I don't know what else to say about it. It's just listen to it. It's the best. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure everyone that's watching this knows this album, probably a lot of you by heart, um, and so don't have to talk too much about it. Um, it lost my 1970 album of the year to Zeppelin Three. It was probably in the 70s, the closest number two that there was. I'm fine with that decision. Zeppelin Three is awesome. Um, I put it slightly over this, but this is probably a top 50 album for me of all time. There's absolutely not one thing wrong with it. The songs are gorgeous. The piano's great. Joe said he's not a great singer, which he's not, but I love his voice and I love just the tone and the expression of his voice. It's yearning and angry. You get so much emotion and passion. It's great. It's after the gold rush, number one. Triple crown. Yeah, it rules. It was a massive surprise as my 1970 winner. It was a surprise to me for one thing. I didn't realize how good it was until I really kind of went back and I just kept listening to it. You know, just from the opener, 
you know, his, his, vo- his vocals work so well. They're not, you know, they're not perfect. They're not great in, in the standard rock milieu. But on an album like this where it's stripped down and kind of heartsick and homesick and kind of low key, it just, it works on every song. He rocks it up on Southern Man, uh, fantastic guitar work. But it, most of the other songs are pretty kind of low key and sort of just really, I don't know, it, it, it has a mood to it, like his other albums. It just works so well and it never really breaks. It just, he, the whole album is like that. A phenomenal writing, phenomenal performances. Uh, the piano, I think, definitely helps. And it's just uh, pretty much a perfect album. Not not too close between number one and number two. This is kind of a runaway winner for me. After the Gold Rush is uh, the number one Neil Young album. We can all agree. Yeah, the thing with his voice is just what people originally loved about rock music is it was so kind of, you know, it's not a classically trained voice. It's literally just a poet being themselves and using song and singing to throw that out. I mean, he's, he's not trying to do anything he's not capable of. It's just, you talk about finding your voice and he's got it and the songwriting matches it. And it's awesome. You really get to know someone through like that style of singing. I know you, Neil. I know you. All right. So 43 albums down. Any final thoughts? I'm not listening to a Neil Young album for 20 years. I'm done. I'll, I'll listen to After the Gold Rush, and then I'll take another shot at Old Ways when I find another CD player. But uh, other than that, I'm, I'm all kneeled out. Yeah, uh, like I said, Neil, top five for me, but maybe a trial separation is in in the works right now between he and I. Reading a lot of like uh, YouTube comments on, on some of his videos, there's a lot of people that love everything he's ever done. And I'm just not, my Neil Young fandom is not on that level at all. Not a lot of bad records, but more mediocre records that I probably never care to listen to again than, than he has good ones. But the good ones are really good. Yeah, I think he's got 20 really good albums and probably 11 albums that I love. So, you know, that's enough for me. For, for an artist of his level, I think he has the most albums that I would never want to hear again of like anyone, any person in history. I'm trying to think of someone else who's just, there's probably 28, 27 albums of his that I just never care to hear again. <laughs> but his, the top of his, his charts are phenomenal. It's some of the best albums ever made, but I don't know. I just, I can't, I just can't do it with Neil. After the seventies, it just kind of, for the most part. He's still a great guy, great artist. I love you, Neil. All right, so um, look forward to hearing from everybody down in the comments. I'm sure people have a lot to say about Neil. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Uh, Subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and check down in the description for links to our social media pages. And uh, we will see you tomorrow with our top 10 favorite Neil Young songs. (laughs) 